In the rivers of North America, something unexpected and deadly may be lurking. There he is, about 10 feet out. He's moving quick. Oh, wait, 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 you got him. Sharks, frightening enough in the ocean, appear to be swimming hundreds of miles inland. Nothing like that come up the river like that before. Monster Quest goes on the hunt for these inland intruders. In Louisiana. Something is definitely holding this down big time. And in the waters of the St. Lawrence River. There was a big bloom right in the middle of the screen. And makes an astonishing find. He just gave me the diver's signal for short. A real life monster. Caught on camera. Yards from shore. Just when you thought it was safe to go back in the river. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers. On Monster Quest. This is the Atchafalaya River in southern Louisiana. It appears serene and peaceful. But just below the surface here and in rivers from Louisiana to Illinois and beyond, something deadly may be lurking. Sharks. When we were picking up the nets, we could tell that it was heavier. It was something different than what we normally catch. Eyewitnesses describe a large muscular shark, sometimes over 10 feet long, turning up in freshwater rivers at times hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean. One major sighting was in Simsport, Louisiana, a small fishing town on the Atchafalaya River. Simsport is some 160 miles from the ocean. But on a summer morning in 2007, something strange appeared in this freshwater river. Fishermen Alan Kimball and Clyde DeFore were fishing for carp. Instead, they caught something far bigger and more dangerous, a shark. The big shark, when it first come up, it was very aggressive. It was biting, it was tearing the net. It never quit fighting. It was a bull shark, five feet long and 130 pounds. We were very surprised because nothing like that come up the river like that before. But it was not just one shark. Photos of their catch that day show a half dozen of them, ranging from three to five feet in length. But all are dwarfed by the one that got away. I know for a fact there's a very big one out there. Very big one. And there was nothing that we had that we could hold that shark with. And we seen something swimming way up ahead, and we thought it was a bear at first. The shark that we seen was most likely about 10 foot long, maybe longer, and 300 pounds plus. Bull sharks can be up to 12 feet long and weigh 700 pounds. They are saltwater predators, but they also appear in freshwater rivers and lakes. Some live in the largest lake in Central America, Lake Nicaragua, where they have killed several people. Are they a new danger in American rivers and lakes as well? Bull sharks are known to be very aggressive. Author Richard Ellis is an expert on the bull shark. Bull sharks are known to attack maliciously for no reason that we know about. Worldwide, there have been more than a thousand attacks by sharks in the last two decades. More than a hundred of which were fatal. We could see that the arm was in the shark's mouth. While there are more than 300 species of shark, bull sharks may be responsible for most of the attacks. 
Monster Quest is looking for its own evidence of these sharks near Morgan City, Louisiana, in the Atchafalaya Basin. This is the largest swamp in the U.S., spanning almost 600,000 acres. Every day, local fishermen and recreational boaters use its canals, lakes, and rivers. It's all fresh water and filled with a variety of fish and animals, all of which could be food for a bull shark. They really are not picky. They're going to go after anything that they can accommodate inside that mouth. They're opportunistic hunters. Lee Hales, a local wildlife expert, is leading the expedition. So there is quite a good possibility of a large number of sharks in this area. Hales is joined by Jacob Seagrave, a local fisherman. Jake, Lee, good morning. Good morning. Together, they will attempt to prove large bull sharks are stalking the waters here. We're located right here. We're approximately 30 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. All right. And we're going to head upstream? Across Grassy Lake, up to Four Mile Bayou. Hales and Seagray will be using a mixture of traditional fishing methods and high-tech military-grade search gear. This is the Ditson sonar system, originally developed by the Navy to look for underwater mines. It uses sound waves to send images of objects underwater. The team will use it to try to see through the muddy, zero-visibility waters of the Atchafalaya. The Ditson unit will give us a great advantage and almost put us at level with the shark in terms of what we can see in the water. Without the sonar, the bull sharks would have the advantage. They are a stealth predator. Dean Fessler is a shark expert and a member of the shark research group. It's not so much that they can see us, it's more important at the beginning they can feel and they can sense us. Bull sharks lurk in the shallows, waiting for their prey. A bull shark will come in and take out a deer that's waiting in the water, a dog that decided to go for a swim at the wrong time, a horse that is, you know, going for a leisurely stroll. A bull shark will take a shot at it. But bull sharks may not be the only sharks lurking in rivers. In the Canadian north, a new, even larger predator could be stalking the St. Lawrence River, miles from the open ocean. The Greenland shark, at 20 feet long, is as big as the great white, and twice the size of a bull, weighing in it more than a ton. They are known to feast on everything, from horse and reindeer carcasses to live seals. Anything that can eat a live marine mammal could potentially hurt a human being. Chris Harvey Clark is a marine biologist and one of the leading experts on these sharks. I think Greenland sharks have probably always been around in cold, deep, dark North Atlantic water and under the ice cap. Because it lives in such inaccessible areas, very little is known about it. What's intriguing is we're now starting to see them in places they haven't been seen before, in numbers they haven't been seen before, and it really begs the question, why? Harvey Clark, along with diver and author Jeffrey Gallant, will search for these sharks in the St. Lawrence River near the town of Bay Camo, Quebec, just 500 miles north of Boston. For Harvey Clark and Gallant, the best way to prove the Greenland sharks are here, stalking the shore, is to dive the river, to see these creatures face to face. But water conditions here make that a difficult job. The most challenging type of diving you can do really is in cold, dark water. The type of diving we're doing here. The water's only a couple of degrees above freezing. It'd be about 35, 36 degrees Fahrenheit. It's dark, it's murky, and furthermore, there are big, scary fish swimming around down there. So yeah, this is challenging diving. They brought along some cutting edge technology to aid them in their search. The Aquapix, a 360 degree time-lapse camera, which can stay below long after the divers leave. And the Video Ray GTO, a remotely operated underwater vehicle manned by Brian Luzzi. If there's sharks down there, this bad boy's gonna find them.
Shark attacks have long been a deadly, though unlikely, scenario along the ocean shore. It's a menace driven home by the 1975 movie Jaws. But evidence suggests these fearsome predators may also be invading our rivers for reasons not completely understood. One frightening encounter took place near Alton, Illinois, north of St. Louis, one late summer day in 1937. According to eyewitness reports, two fishermen were in a small boat on the Mississippi, struggling with something big. Over the past weeks, a mysterious predator had been stalking the river, slicing nets and cutting lines. So they set out to catch it with a specially baited trap. And they were amazed by what they found. Photos taken at the time show what appears to be a five foot long shark. Alton is 600 miles from the Gulf of Mexico, up the Mississippi River. How could a shark that lives in salt water reach this place? MonsterQuest gave this photographic evidence to shark expert Richard Ellis to see if it could be a hoax. It was quite obviously a bull shark. It had the flat, rounded snout of a bull shark, which most sharks don't have. A very particularly large mouth for a shark of that size, and also the characteristic teeth of bull sharks, which are small, sharp, triangular in shape, and they're serrated. Another of history's shark encounters was much more deadly. It was part of a series of attacks which inspired the popular book and movie, Jaws. The first and most famous shark attack story is the 1916 attacks in Matawan, New Jersey. It began in the town of Beach Haven, north of Atlantic City. When on July 1st, 1916, a shark attacked and killed a 25-year-old man named Charles Van Sant. It happened again five days later, 50 miles up the coast. A young bellhop named Charles Bruder lost his life when a shark severed his legs just 130 yards offshore. But the worst was yet to come. What happened shortly thereafter is that in Matawan, New Jersey, there were two shark attacks that was in the river. A river called Matawan Creek. The attacks happened two miles away from the ocean. On July 12th, a young boy playing in the creek was suddenly pulled under. Eyewitnesses said a shark was in the water. The boy and a 24-year-old man who tried to help him were both killed by the mystery shark. 30 minutes later, half a mile away, another boy was bitten on the leg but managed to escape the beast. At that point, people began to really panic seriously because whatever they knew about sharks, they knew that there weren't supposed to be sharks in the river. Eventually, this great white shark was captured in Raritan Bay, not far from Matawan. Newspapers proclaimed that the killer shark had been captured. But Richard Ellis doubts a great white was to blame. Well, from what we know now about bull sharks, it seems to me that the shark that did the attacking in 1916, shark or sharks, were bull sharks. He believes this because Matawan Creek is brackish, and great white sharks have never been found in fresh or brackish water, while bull sharks have. Bull sharks have a unique capability for their size to be able to transcend from saltwater to freshwater systems. They basically can reboot their internal systems the way we reboot our computers when something goes wrong. The world record for inland travel for a bull shark was 2,600 miles up the Amazon River. In North America, bull sharks are normally found in the Atlantic. 
from Florida to Long Island, New York, all through the Gulf of Mexico, and in the Pacific from Mexico to Los Angeles. But their adaptability to fresh water means they can also get into rivers and swim inland to places a shark would never be expected. It's day one of Monster Quest search for bull sharks on Louisiana's inland waterways. The team has chosen an area just outside Morgan City, Louisiana, a town with a population of 12,000. This would be Four Mile Bayou, right here. To catch a shark, Hales and Seagrave will set a line of baited hooks across the river here. It's called a trot line. We'll take this and anchor it to our trot line, and we'll stretch it across to the tree over there. It might look flimsy, but this line is tough and can easily hold a 200-pound catfish or a much larger predator. With the line in place, Hales and Seagrave add the bait. We're going to take this hook and uh, we'll take a piece of fish. And we'll hook the fish, a finger mullet, and we have a swivel and then a snap. The bait is set. Now they need to wait it out to see if any sharks take it. Further north, the hunt for a Greenland shark in the St. Lawrence River is heating up. The St. Lawrence River begins in the freshwater Great Lakes, flowing east to empty into the Atlantic Ocean. Millions of people live on or near it. But most don't realize an animal as big as a great white may be lurking just beneath the surface. The expedition team is targeting Bay Kimo, Quebec, 500 miles north of Boston. Bay Kimo is where in 2003, this eyewitness, local diver Jean E. Foré, says he was shocked by something he saw in the river. I was uh, in the water and I saw a large shape uh, over me. Foré was at a depth of around 100 feet the shape blocked out the sun above him. Look, what, what's that? It's, it's, it's a shark, but what kind of shark? We, we didn't know at this time. So I was surprised to see a shark in the river. Foray wasn't the only person to see something in the St. Lawrence River. Well, the first divers that reported to us weren't really sure what they were seeing. Marine biologist Chris Harvey Clark was one of the first to investigate the eyewitness accounts. There are very few things that are giant and swim slowly. This has got to be a Greenland shark. Its traditional habitat is around the Arctic Circle, Greenland, Iceland, and northern and western Europe. And scientists thought it spent most of its life at great depths, sometimes a mile under the surface. So the, the amazing thing is these sharks really aren't supposed to be here. These are sharks of the abyss. They're rare in shallow water. The divers need to take great care because the behavior of this species is unpredictable. It's a scavenger and a predator, and that is what gives us the tension when we're diving with this animal underwater because we don't really know what it's up to. Is it in scavenger mode or predator mode? In predator mode, the shark could pose a threat. While there are no documented attacks on people, the animal has on occasion shown interest in human beings. A park warden in 1940 even reported being stalked by a Greenland shark while walking across the frozen Saguenay Fjord, 200 miles southeast of Bay Camo. The man was walking on the ice and there was a Greenland shark following him as he was walking and then eyeing him the whole time. The first step in the expedition is to determine the best dive location. I think today we should go check out the uh, the whale jaw site. Yeah. Oh, de Fur.
is an interesting site because uh, there's a whalebone deposit here from a recent, uh, recently dead, probably in the last 10, 15 years, uh, blue whale. And of course, this is what would attract a carcass scavenger. So it's a great place to start our expedition. They're in the water. And as the divers soon discover, so is something else. The Monster Quest team is diving in the St. Lawrence River, looking for evidence of a real life monster, the Greenland shark. The divers are just yards from shore in a cove popular with kayakers. As they head for the bottom, set of ghostly remains comes into view. They are the bones of a blue whale, the largest known animal on the planet. At some point, Greenland sharks may have feasted on the remains. And studies suggest these sharks appear in the same spots year after year. The divers canvass the area all around the remains, but there is no sign of sharks. They are nearly out of air and have to end the search for now. For the next dive, they want to find an area that mimics the shark's natural habitat. Dark murky water. There's a place like that five miles to the northeast, an inlet called Bay de Saint Pancras. It's fed by a series of waterfalls which stir up the sediment in the river here. How are you doing there? Harvey Clark and Gallant set up here on another dock. This time they are going to employ another set of eyes besides their own. A small ROV, or remotely operated underwater vehicle. This is the uh, Video Ray GTO with a Blue View 900 kilohertz high definition imaging sonar attached to it. It's normally used by industry and by the military for jobs like underwater port security. Brian Luzzi from Video Ray will run it from inside this boat at the dock. The ROV has two powerful thrusters that propel it over four knots underwater. It's equipped with lights, a wide-angle color video camera, and sonar with a 100-foot range. On the sonar, any sharks will appear as black oblong shapes against the red background. Once underwater, the divers will rely on sign language if they see a shark. So when we're working with video ray, what we do is let them know there's a shark around. We just give them the shark sign and we point in the direction and then hopefully video ray will be able to pick it up with the sonar and then give pursuit. The first mission on this dive is to deploy the Aquapix time-lapse camera. Okay. They've attached it to large concrete blocks to keep it on the bottom. Ah, oh, watching the divers uh, place the aqua picks down there. Lucy's main screen shows the video feed from the ROV. The sonar feed is to Lucy's left. So uh, hopefully, when they're gone, because it can stay down there all night, if it has to, that it'll pick up uh, some sharks for us. The camera is set. The divers head off to begin their search. see the divers on the sonar. They make their way towards the middle of the bay, roughly 30 feet from the shoreline. The bottom here is 60 feet down. Visibility is only about 10 feet. These sharks have been known to stalk their prey in the water, uh, divers included. All of a sudden, uh, an oblong shape flies by on the sonar. It's definitely 
It's moving. There's something big in the water. But Lucy is the only one who can see it. Long torpedo shaped body and it just kind of darted, darted across um, pretty quickly. A tail appears visible on the sonar image. Could this be their Greenland shark? But the divers haven't seen it, and there is no way to warn them it's near. Then, the shape disappears. I couldn't keep up with it. It kind of swam in and out of the range. Below, the divers still have not seen what Lucy saw, but their air is too low to keep searching. No sharks. No, nice and dark and gloomy though. They should have been there. I think the vis is so bad, one could be on top of us and you wouldn't know it. It's very, very dark. But this sonar hit means they were close. They'll go back down in this spot as soon as they and the gear are ready. Meanwhile, deep in the Atchafalaya Basin, Jacob Seagrave and Lee Hales are checking their lines. They're in a canal 15 miles outside of Morgan City, Louisiana. The bait has been in the water three hours. Feel something on the line here. We've got a splash. Something is definitely holding this down big time. I can barely pull this up. Oh. I just felt it break free. Something was really fighting me. But whatever it was, is gone. Hales deploys the sonar unit to try to find visual evidence of what may be feeding on his bait. The underwater image from the Didson sonar plays on a laptop computer. So with what I'm seeing here, this is a large food supply. This whole screen right now is just filled with bigger and smaller fish moving backwards and forwards. And there is something else here. Yeah, right there. Stop right there. There's a good-sized fish right in front of you right now, headed behind me. You seeing anything on the surface? But it's not a shark. It could be a catfish. They can grow to four feet long in this area. There would be a catfish that'd be slow-moving like that, and about the size that you had said. The day is almost over, and no sign of bull sharks yet. Hales and Seagrave try another tactic in their hunt. Now at night we're going to switch over to a jug line. And the jug line is going to float and be a little more free moving. Jug lines are hooks attached to plastic jugs which float freely in the water. They are traditionally used to catch catfish and other large fish. They can travel possibly anywhere from a hundred feet to a half a mile in one night, just depending on tide and current, wind. Just take the line with you in one hand, throw the jug first, and when you release the jug, throw the hook with it. And there it goes. Good job. By nightfall, the jugs are all in the water, where they'll stay overnight. In the Atchafalaya River Basin, outside of Morgan City, Louisiana, the Monster Quest team is checking their lines for proof that saltwater predator sharks are in this freshwater river. They've left several jug lines and a trot line overnight. They pulled the trot line first, and there are signs something was here. Some took that. Some was really hungry. This hook was broken right off by something. The next step is to pull in the jug lines, which they released nearby. But most of the jug lines are missing. Jug lines could travel anywhere from 100 feet to half a mile to a mile, just depending on how far the current and the wind blows them. They could have been picked up by another fisherman, or strong currents could have dragged them to an entirely different location. Seagrave has a third theory. A big enough fish can pull that jug under the water. 
So a bull shark or another large fish could have dragged the jugs underwater and away from here. It's time to head back home, but Hales is still convinced that the bull sharks are here. Well, we didn't catch a bull shark, but we have proof. We have evidence of people catching them further north. So this must be an area where they're moving in and out. It's just an ideal environment for bull sharks. Meanwhile, it's day two of the Monster Quest expedition in the St. Lawrence River in search of giant Greenland sharks. Earlier, the sonar picked up a large oblong shape at this spot in this bay. But the divers have not found anything on their daytime dives. So they've decided to search at night. Data from studies of Greenland sharks tagged with radio transmitters shows that at night they may be more aggressive and enter shallower water. As night comes on, here we are getting out to like six, seven, eight o'clock at night, they start doing these very, very large migrations and their mean depth goes from 200 feet to about 60 feet. But a night dive is risky. To do it safely, Harvey Clark and Gallant are using special underwater halogen lights, which have been used in the past to illuminate wrecks like the Titanic. The lights hang off the end of the dock to provide a bright, secure area where the divers can see what's coming at them. As night falls, the ROV starts hunting for sharks. Suddenly, it finds a target. You look at the radar. What do we got there? That's a shark. Yeah, that looks like that's a shark. A shark. That's yeah. definitely a shark. There he is, there he is, about 10 feet out. He's moving quick. The sonar clearly shows a large torpedo shape. The divers suit up. Got both divers here. I'm just kind of watching their backs. The divers descend into the lighted safety zone. But they'll have to leave it to have any hope of finding the shark. Ready to head off into the abyss. Topside, Lucy has trouble making visual contact with the divers in the dark. I'm pretty much blind and flying by sonar. The divers make their way towards the deeper section of the bay where the sonar picked up the shark. They're swimming side by side now. The bottom quickly drops down 50 feet, 60 feet. Their heads are on swivels right now looking for sharks. They reach their destination and they are not alone. Is that? Well, I got three objects here. I got two divers that I've been following, and then there was a big bloom right in the middle of the screen. So it can only be one thing. Shark. But the shark is just out of range of the video camera. All the ROV can see is murky water. Lucy can't communicate with the divers, and the divers are unaware of the shark. And then, the sonar goes blank. The ROV has lost the divers and the shark. I can't see him anymore. Finally, the divers' bubbles appear next to the dock. I'm right on top of them. Yeah. All right, I reacquired our divers here. They surface never having seen the shark. That was interesting. Well, no sharks, though. But the shark was there. 
they may have missed it by a matter of feet. It was a little chilling, you know, knowing it's out there. Sharks, some of nature's most fearsome and ancient predators, have ruled the oceans for millions of years. But there is evidence some are swimming far from the sea, to inland locations where they are completely unexpected. These men claim they caught a bull shark in Illinois in 1937, over 600 miles from the ocean. These men say they caught several bull sharks in Louisiana in 2007, 160 miles from the ocean. And this diver saw a shark above him in the St. Lawrence River so big, it blocked out the sun overhead. Monster Quest is on an expedition in the St. Lawrence looking for sharks the size of great whites in the cold, dark water here. So in our images like these, which appear to show fins in a tail, suggest that a Greenland shark is in this bay. But so far, the divers have not seen the creature with their own eyes. The morning following their night dive, Chris Harvey Clark and Jeffrey Gallant return to retrieve the Aquapix camera. The camera was left overnight at the bottom of the bay. The divers, they're on their way to recover the, uh, the Aquapix. Gallant uses a dive knife to cut the ties, holding it in place. They've actually just finished uh, detaching it, so he signaled to me the ROV that's ready to come up, so the uh, topside crew is going to get ready to help him out, pull it up. And up goes the aquapix. The camera is pulled topside and is hooked to this laptop. I can see Jeffrey Gallant's gear case there and a rope going in the water. This is just before we deployed it. But once the camera was in the sediment-filled water, the image quality was problematic. Unfortunately, uh, there's just so much crud in the water, we just can't get good images. There could be a shark four feet from there, could be. we wouldn't see it. Well, we've got just terrible dark water conditions to work in. And that's, the, that's really the problem here. So far, these sonar images from the ROV are the best evidence yet of sharks in the river. The divers return to the floating dock to try one more time to get their own evidence. Brian Luzzi makes a quick sweep of the bay with the video ray. But he's not finding the shark he saw on sonar last night. You've been surveying with the video ray. Yeah, I've been flying it like right in the zone, uh, yeah. about 45, between 45 and 60 feet for about half an hour. And nothing? Um, haven't seen anything. Yeah, okay. Not at all. They swim out into the frigid bay, down to about 30 feet. They're searching for a creature big enough to swallow seals. Then, contact. At least on sonar. Yeah, that's a big return on there. That was much bigger than a diver's. I mean, that's a big shark. The outline of a shark is clear. See a shadow there? See fan's tail? And it's within striking distance of the divers. There he is. We've got a shark at 20 feet out here. But this time, the divers see it too. He's got a shark. He just gave me the diver signal for shark. Fin to the forehead. The shark is right below them. I'm coming up on his dorsal fin. Getting pretty close to his head. The shark is massive and looks to be a female based on lack of male anatomy, a sort of modified pelvic fin. It's covered with a spider web of cuts and scratches. Researchers believe these sharks live as long as 200 years possibly the longest living vertebrates on the planet. Plenty of time to get banged and bruised. The shark floats along the river bottom with the video ray in tow. 
still on on his tail a little bit. He's he's getting shallow. It's moving slowly, but it could easily outpace the divers at any moment. The shark is now only a few yards from the shore and almost directly below the dock. Found him in 23 feet of water. That's pretty shallow, man. They come up close, close to the shore, close to the dock. And then, you know, people swim off this thing. Harvey Clark uses a special green laser measurement system to get a reading of the shark's size. It looks to be at least 12 feet long and close to 1,000 pounds. But suddenly, the shark heads out to deeper water. He's moving pretty quick. I think we might have spooked him, but um, that was awesome. The divers can't go after it. They're running out of air. Reluctantly, they surface. Wow. Big female. Yeah, that, that was good. 12 feet. The dive confirms what eyewitnesses have long claimed. Huge sharks are living in the St. Lawrence River, close to shore, in shallow water. Climate change may be altering their feeding habits. Or they may have been here all along, waiting to be discovered. This time, they seem to pose no threat to humans. But they have had so little human contact, it remains unclear if they really are a danger. Only more up-close study of these creatures will answer that question. And although Monster Quest's expedition to the Atchafalaya Basin came up empty, bull sharks were there. One week after Monster Quest shot this interview with fisherman Alan Kimball, he caught another one. This photo shows the six-foot-long, 200-pound bull shark he pulled in 160 miles from the ocean. So at least some sharks are in North American river systems far from the oceans where they belong. And as long as they are here, there remains the possibility that an attack like the one in Matawan, New Jersey in 1916 could happen again. In the shallow waters, you'd be in real danger, real danger in shallow waters. You could, seriously, if he wanted to take you down, take, take a bite of you, he could. It's not only the fact that we find these sharks in the deep sea, but the fact that we find them in an environment that's so different from the deep sea that's intriguing. I mean, if you can tolerate thousands of tons of pressure in the deep sea and then come up into a river mouth in 20 or 30 feet of water, why are you doing that? What on earth is the advantage to you as a shark? That's the question we have to ask.